we look for pragmatic solutions to real world problems. And that means that we know that thoughts and prayers don't do but uh, this guy's whole whole purpose behind his campaign was to make sure that trans people couldn't pee. Most of the champions of evolution, most of the pioneers of evolution have been or still are Christians. Creationism, like every other religious assertion, they just want to be able to say whatever they want to believe as if it was a fact. Now, anybody else would consider that lying, but in religion, they call that absolute truth. I've always felt blessed. Okay. I'm an atheist, and I feel blessed. Things have always worked out for me. Things have always worked out well for me. I used to take my emu for walks down to the park. <laughs> and <it's> <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. go that is mr Arn raw and some of the one-liners that he laid on us during this fantastic interview yeah it was it was a good interview yeah we didn't even intend it to be what it was we thought it was gonna be like 10 15 yeah, minute yeah. segment you know we're not gonna take up Arn raw's time this <laughs> right. guy's a big deal he's well known you know in the atheist like, you activism. want to know about evolution let me tell you about evolution <laughs> yeah <laughs> and first of all when you reached out to him, like, Psh, we're not getting Aaron, Aaron Raw on the show. He's not coming on the show. And then we get this comment on the video, and he's like, hey, yes, yeah, someone... You just gotta believe. <laughs> can you can you own up to why he couldn't reply to you? You want to own up to that you now? You gotta have faith. Yeah, okay. <laughs> we get, this is a great story. Good. All right, hold on. But before you tell it, let me tell what happened. So we get a comment on the channel... And Aaron Ra's like, yeah, uh, I was invited to be on this this discussion, but I can't seem to reply to the person who sent me the invite. It won't <laughs> let me. And I didn't know what had happened because Deasis had reached out to him. But Deasis, why couldn't he reply to you? <laughs> Aaron, it's me, Trollio. <laughs> Your long lost buddy, man. <laughs> I used to chime in on his page yeah. all the time and, and debate evolution and the biogenesis with him. Mm. And he would just get really pissed off. And I would say shit that would really piss everyone else off. You know, because I'd be like, oh, well, if that's true, if, you know, this is this, then how do we know this, this, and this? And, you know, Aaron, he's like, well, as I explained to you the first time in my first response, which obviously you didn't understand, you know, he didn't break it down. <laughs> simply, so I'm like, oh, so what does that mean? Finally, he just blocks me. And he's like, Trollio has been blocked and everyone's like, you know, clicking the like button on it. So, yeah, Aaron, it's, uh, uh, I hope you're doing well. <laughs> praise, praise atheism, praise the atheists. But yes, it I is love, I. I love Trollio. <laughs> he blocked you from his channel, and then you managed to get him to interview for the show. Which, first of all, I got two things to say about that before we play the interview. The first one is, thank you very much, yeah. Mr. Arn Raw. It was a fantastic interview. No, we We're very it. glad to have had you. He covered so many things yeah. we didn't expect him to talk about, from politics, evolution, to creationist, yep. to personal growth. Yeah. The emu section is, wait till he starts talking about his emus. It's just a great discussion from a very eloquent, intelligent guy and i was very glad to have yeah. it but also Definitely. the fact that he talks about his <clears throat> personal growth and how he's changed through the years it was, i thought it was kind of fitting that he came on the show even though you were trollio and he had blocked you because you too have grown a whole I lot have, in your I perspective have. and outlook since that so five good. years ago when i providence first, yeah providence well five years ago when i first started talking to him and chiming in on his page and uh, watching his videos, I did not think that my first discussion with him would go so well. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it turns out uh, he's a really nice guy. Yeah. 
Yep. Unless, uh, you know, you debate evolution. <laughs> but even then, even then, I, I noticed that when he was making his arguments, yeah, he has a lot of strong words, but he was directing them for the most Definitely part. Definitely doesn't mince it. For the most part, he was directing them towards the ideas that he disagrees with yeah. and not so much towards the people. But there was one or two exceptions of people apparently he's had a lot of bad blood yeah. with. and So he had a few choice words about Everybody them. knows on <laughs> if you're into science and atheism in America. Yeah. But I really expected a whole lot more of that than he gave. And I was very impressed with that. Didn't yeah, agree with too. everything he said, but I will say he had facts, evidence, and a lot of education behind no, he did, everything he, he said. He didn't throw anything out there that was completely baseless either, and I appreciated that. I wouldn't say that there's anything that I directly agree with nor disagree with. And I still, I still hold most... I did learn a few things, but I still hold you know, a lot of the same position that I had before we interviewed together. Um, I am agnostic. Um, and I question both sides. So to be fair, I question uh, the side of, you know, law of attraction, magic, the universe talking to us, positive vibes, negative vibes. And I question science, evolution, atheism, and a biogenesis too. I question anything. Yeah. That, yeah I question yeah. anything that I can't. I question anything that I have not experienced for myself. And I'm a skeptic of anything that, you know. I can't verify for my own self, yeah. but I'm respectful of, uh, I'm respectful of other views too. So anyways, but yeah. I, I don't know if Aaron originated the quote, but I saw it associated with him when I was looking yeah. him up that <clears throat> any assertion made without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. And he yeah, definitely, a long time. he definitely, uh, shows that to be his general approach yeah. to this subject. He is your straight up 110% materialist. Yeah, sure. He is a materialist. So, yeah. All right. Well, with all that said, let's go ahead and play his interview. And after it's over, we'll just wrap it up a little bit before we let you guys go. Okay. So we want to welcome a very special guest to the show. Um, Aaron Ra. He does living science videos and has a really big YouTube channel following. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, you're either running for Texas State Senate or ran for Texas State Senate, right? Ran for, ran for. Okay. That, was a, that was a year or two back. And okay. I was in politics just long enough to know that I did not want to be in politics. <laughs> so, <laughs> Okay. Well, I didn't know that. Yeah, and, I encourage uh, other people to do that who, are, who have the aptitude for it, but I don't. Right, right. Yeah. Well, I mean, you seem like you'd be a little too real for it. We were talking, me and John were talking about that before uh, you came on. It's just like, wow, I'm surprised he would he would do that because you got to be uh, pretty phony. You're not really the phony type. Yeah, that's there. There was that uh, about yeah. the only thing I was looking forward to was uh, doing debates <clears throat> against the Republican uh, yeah. op opponent. And honestly, it. it, it even if I didn't win the seat, I mean, all I really wanted to do was just get debates in there because this guy was such a complete card. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm like you, I can't be politically correct. If somebody's full of shit, I just got to call them out and be like, yeah, I'm sorry. That just doesn't make any damn sense. But uh, this guy's whole, whole purpose behind his campaign was to make sure that trans people couldn't pee. That was, that was his principal issue. Yeah. yeah. And I don't, I don't, I don't see how, you know, in, infringing other people's rights is a platform. Right. Right. Yeah. And I remember we were talking about this a little bit earlier. Um, cause, uh, I think we both kind of consider ourselves, you know, not to, not completely to one side or the other, but somewhere in the middle as uh, independence. And, um, yeah, I don't. I don't know uh, what what that means. I mean, I'm I'm unapologetically left. I'm not in the middle. Oh, are I'm you in the middle? I'm I'm in the middle of the left. Oh, you're in the middle. Okay, okay. So I'm I'm definitely left of center. I'm not a centrist at all. I gotcha. And the reason that I say that, I want people to understand what the left means. Okay. Uh, the the biggest issue that I see with wrong with politics right now, <laughs> those dogs. So yeah, all night, barkomatic over here. I bet you get really good sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he sleeps under our bed like a huge, huge uh, teddy bear or something. But anyway, 
what was I saying before he started going off? Uh, yeah, you were saying that you're in the middle of the left. Oh, yeah. Um, it, what I see wrong with the politics uh, in the country right now, well, there's lots of things wrong with our politics right now, but one of them being uh, that, that people don't understand the, what a left and a right is. And it's not really a left-right situation. The real problem is the other axis on the uh, political compass. <laughs> All right, so we're back after that. Sorry for the technical difficulties. I think the dogs wanted to chime in. But um, we were talking about politics, and uh, I was saying that I feel like I'm somewhat in the middle, and you say that you're in the middle of leftists. Yeah, yeah, and the reason that I say that, I, I think that, uh, that, that human rights uh, have more precedence than corporate profits. I mean, and the, the biggest problem that we have, and one of the several major problems that we have in politics right now, is that if you just look at the left-right spectrum, which this is, our current situation is not even about that. Our current situation is not even on that axis. If you look up the political compass, you'll see that there's another axis between authoritarianism and anti-authoritarianism. And that's where the real anti-authoritarianism, also known as libertarianism, except not to be confused with the Libertarian Party, which is exclusively a right-wing group. Uh, libertarianism wow. okay. as being an anti-authoritarian position can also occupy on the left. Now, every president that has been elected in my lifetime, and I'm 57, you know, John F. Kennedy was president when I was when I was born. So every president since then in my entire lifetime, and a few before then, were all all of them in the authoritarian right. Every one of them. That's Clinton and Bush and Obama and Trump and all of them, all of them authoritarian right. And now we have, uh, uh, we have uh, Sanders and Warren. For the first time in my life, we have candidates in the anti-authoritarian left, which has not existed before. And so a lot of people want to say that, that the Obama and Hillary and so forth were on the left. They are not. Both of them, both Hillary and Obama, have described themselves as moderate Republicans. Their politics actually put them on the right. Not as far right as Trump, but on the right. Uh, when you draw that line, that, that plus sign that makes up those four quadrants, they're on the right of the center, whereas I am on the left. I am where, where Sanders is. I am where Noam Chomsky is. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. So you're for the people more than corporations. That's good. I remember uh, years ago watching some of your videos and you, you have said in a couple of your videos that you're a humanist. Yeah. So. And that to summary, to give, to give a summary description of what that means is that regardless of your religious perspective, you know, most humanists are, are, are atheist at the same time, but that's not exclusively <clears throat> true. I mean, we do have some humanists who have religious beliefs at the same time. The, the idea of humanism is that we look for pragmatic solutions to real world problems. And that means that we know that thoughts and prayers don't do <laughs> that we, we need to actually take action and we need to make donations and we need to actually do something to try to make situation better. We can't literally wish upon a star that you'll get the help that you need and not do anything about it because that doesn't help. All right. So telling, telling you that I will pray for you has exactly the same credence as telling you that I will write a letter to Santa to solve your problem. Interesting. Okay. So in this episode, we're talking a lot about evolution. And we've even talked a little bit about creationism uh, in the pre-recorded segments. And we are trying to represent both sides uh, fairly, as fairly as possible. And I know that you're a materialist. Um, which is re not really relevant to this well, argument. Well, because most of the champions of evolution, most of the pioneers of evolution have been or still are Christians. Okay, all right. So creationism is defined as a sort of reality denial wherein you reject evolution specifically, but, but not just that. You, you, you more generally, you're rejecting methodological naturalism, which is the scientific methodology that posits that, uh, that all 
claims have to be based on evidence. See, creationism, like every other religious assertion, they just want to be able to say whatever they want to believe as if it was a fact. You know, I don't know if you ever saw that old show, Cheers, where that guy, where one character on Cheers, the, the, the postman, Norm, would like start spouting off statistics that he just made up off of the top of his head. Now, anybody else would consider that lying, but in religion, they call that absolute truth. Right. It's whenever you make up shit and spout it like it's true, that's absolute truth. And it's because, you know, why not? Because God is talking to you through your head, and who are we supposed to argue with that, Right. Because you have such a great relationship with God, you know better than the Pope, who, by the way, also endorses evolution. The last yeah, he does. popes, the last few he popes, does. have all endorsed evolution, saying that it is a reality. Now, I want to talk to you. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about what I believe, and mm -hmm. uh, and then after that, um, I want you to tell me what you think about that, and then in the end. Um, at the end of the interview, I want to talk a little bit about a biogenesis and how you feel about that. But right now, um, I wrote down a couple of things and I want, I want to run them by you because I'm sure you'll have something to say about it. Um, <clears throat> here's how I feel about evolution. I'm going to tell you, I'm just going to go through my list real quick. It's a short one, but, um, I feel like there is intellectual dishonesty on both sides. I got a and challenge for you on that. Okay, good. I, I can prove to the contrary. Okay, all right. I want to. I want to hear that. I do. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, you know the transitional uh, fossils that we've had. Uh, for instance, if I'm not mistaken, Lucy being one of the best examples. But when you look at the actual bone fragments, there's hardly any. Um, what do you mean bone fragments? There's hardly any. What does that mean? Well, just the whole. Um, for instance, if I'm not mistaken, and like I said, I'm you know I'm not, by no means a professional on this, as much as I am an enthusiast about the subject in general. But if you look at uh, Lucy, who is supposedly one of the best examples of the ape to man, uh, if I'm not mistaken, aren't the bone fragments very sparse and ambiguous? And it's something that you could, uh, you know, really draw or craft into anything you want it to it's just it's it's really no not remotely okay uh for it for first to, to begin with okay um we had already discovered australopithecus species before we discovered lucy we discovered australopithecus africanus <clears throat> uh about a hundred years ago and okay. then lucy was the one that darwin had himself had predicted okay that we would find a a, a creature that was morphologically halfway between what was uh, what was then known as the the most primitive humans, which was Homo erectus, and okay. the the current living apes, uh, because we didn't have in Darwin's day we didn't have in, in fossil apes yet discovered. Most of paleontology hadn't been discovered by the time that he was. Alive. What's the name of the one found in Australia again? In Australia, or would you say? I'm sorry. What'd you say? I said Australopithecus. Okay. <laughs> um, is that one, you know, is the skeleton of that one also very... There are th we, they have so far discovered 300 individuals of okay. that species. Okay. So we have essentially the entire skeleton, although very rarely do you ever find a complete skeleton. The only way you can get an absolutely complete skeleton is if it's a lithographic fossil. And we have that too. As a matter of fact, uh, Darwin predicted the two different transitional species. He predicted that what was called the missing link between humans and apes, and that one was discovered by David Johansson in 1974. Creationists will lie and say that that was never discovered, and they'll, 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 they will lie and say that it's just a chimpanzee, and they'll lie about any other way that they can, but that's not the case. We know a whole lot of morphological differences that put Lucy or the Australopithecus afarensis species, and by the way, there, there's a lots more Australopithecus and Paranthropus than just Lucy. There's, we've we found literally dozens of okay. intermediate species. It's just from her species we have three hundred individuals from that one, and so they have. And they're better reduced, examples than Lucy, right? Uh, Lucy's a fairly good example because Think we have so? enough. Yeah, because we have we had enough to identify all of the traits that Darwin had predicted. Okay. The, only the thing reason, we, the only I, thing and the reason missing... that I say that is because when I've looked at the actual actual bone fragments of Lucy uh, on Google, of course, uh, you see just a partial skull 
and then it seems like a couple of ribs. And I yeah, and I it's usually looking, laid out like it's like it's laid out on a yeah. plate so for for a photograph, so that you don't really know how the bones go together. They just lay the bones out for a photo. Yeah, I remember looking at that, and I remember thinking, okay, well, an artist rendition, uh, or somebody could anybody could really craft that into anything that they wanted yeah, to you, because it's so you, ambiguous. When you lay out the bones yeah. so that you can take a picture of them all in a flat plane, the average person is not going to know how they go together. Okay. But when those fragments of skull, when you, when you, you pick them up in three dimensions and see how <clears> they're going <throat> together, then you're able to measure you know, n brain capacity, for example. I mean, and uh, for one, one of the important things with Lucy was that they identified the location of the foramen magnum, magnum which is the hole in the skull where the, uh, the spinal cord goes. Now, in a chimpanzee, that, that hole is in the back of the skull. And in a human, it's directly beneath because our head sits on top of our neck instead of in front of our neck. Does that make sense? So if you were yeah. walking, if you were able to walk around as a quadruped, if you had like yeah. ridiculously short back legs and so right. you're able to walk around on all you'd fours. You'd be walking more like this. You'd be looking down at the ground. Yeah. So, but, but uh, chimpanzees look forward. So there, there's foramen magnum is in the back of their skull. Right. And Lucy's is intermediate directly between where a chimpanzee's is and where a human's is. Same with thing with the pelvis. The, the shape of the pelvis on Australopithecus afarensis is halfway between a chimpanzee pelvis and a human pelvis. Same with the feet, which were discovered in later uh, examples. And footprints, so the Laetoli prints, for example, which were, which were in fossilized um, uh, volcanic ash, showing that you know, their, 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 their front toe is splayed more than ours. The Laetoli prints uh, were you know, humanoid footprints in ash that because they're, you know, they're, they're volcanic, they're, we can date those. And so that they, they date back to the same time as the, the fossils for Lucy do. So we, we, we also found foot bones for Lucy. So all of this coordinates. Okay. Yeah. So just out of curiosity, uh, real quick, um, just for the viewers, how do you know, or what convinces you that we are definitely in the line uh, uh, or Lucy's definitely in the line of us, or that we're definitely related to uh, Lucy. Well, because I'm looking at this a little bit differently than you are. I'm looking at it from a phylogenetic standpoint. Okay. So I'm looking at it cladistically. Now, or Linnaeus. Clade. I remember you talking about clades. Yeah. So, so Carolus Linnaeus in the 1700s, I think it was 1735, he came up with Systema Natura. He, he was the first one to try to classify all living things. Now, he was a creationist. He lived 100 years before Darwin. He had no idea about, uh, about evolution at all. Uh, he was before, he was before uh, um, Lamarckism, even. So he had, there was, evolution was not a concept for him. He thought that species were fixed and that every species was created by God. But what he realized in classifying them was that he did not come up with the list of created kinds that one might expect. He said every collection of species fits into a parent category, and all of those parent categories collectively fit into larger parent categories that, that include certain groups of them. And all of those larger groups fit into even larger groups that compress them, right? So it's... How do I how do I describe this? You know, like like ducks, for example, like mallards are ducks, but they're not the only ducks. You know, we also have, you know, you have Peking ducks and Muscovies and so forth. And then we have in the Anseriformes, we also have the larger category, which includes the, the other Anseriformes like geese and so forth, and all the different species of geese. And then larger than that, now we've got another collection of chickens and everything, and they are more closely related to the ducks than say just to make this easy, like eagles and hawks or vultures, on, they're on a different category, and then sparrows and on all the, they're in another category, but they're all within the larger parent category. And then there's another completely separate parent category for uh, ostriches and emus and so forth. So they're, they're now you have like two for neonase and paleonase. So all the birds we know fall into one or the two. And then we have a bunch of fossil birds that don't fall into either of those. They fall into other peripheral groups and even larger categories that go back through time until they begin to include what, you know, what we traditionally recognize as dinosaurs. So that we realize that birds don't just look like dinosaurs, they are dinosaurs, literally. That actually brings me to something that I did want to talk to you about also. So I've always had a hard time accepting that birds are dinosaurs, and I want to tell you why. Um, you've talked a lot about in your videos about Archaeopteryx 
And and this is probably a layman's question here. I'm probably asking a you know total question that you hear every day, but aren't dinosaurs supposed to be uh, reptiles or related to reptiles in nature and thereby cold blooded, whereas birds are warm blooded? That was a bit of creationist uh, pseudoscience that began in the mid in the early 1800s. Okay, under the, the leader of well, he was the the initial father of paleontology was. Okay. Uh, I can't believe I can't think of it. Because I'd like to know your thoughts on this. Yeah, well, so the, the founder, if you've ever been to London, you've ever seen the, 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 the London Museum of Natural History. It's a magnificent building. It's like the most magnificent you know, paleo history museum ever created. And it was created by Sir Richard Owen. It was founded by Sir Richard Owen. It's a magnificent structure. However, Sir Richard Owen was a creationist. He was also the world's foremost expert on paleontology in his time. So if Richard Owen had ever met a young earth creationist, he would find that very confusing because he knew that the earth is ancient. He knew how to prove that the earth is ancient. He knew more about fossil species than literally anybody else on the planet. But he had these weird religious beliefs that he thought that God was a tinkerer who would learn from his own mistakes and that God would come up with, with newer, improved designs that would be better than the older designs. So that I guess he just canceled out the dinosaurs. <laughs> exactly. So 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 Lene or um, um Sir Richard Owen, who was who was actually a he was well respected once upon a time because he was the foremost authority, but he was also a vindictive shit who was eventually <laughs> run out of the Royal Society for a whole bunch of different crimes, based largely on his religious beliefs. And one of them being that he lied about the disassociation of humans and apes. He made up a part of the brain that humans, he said, had that apes did not. And Thomas Huxley indicted him at the Royal Society during one of their meetings when he called, out, called him out to say that no one who had ever examined the brain of an ape agreed with Richard Owen. That, and Richard, that wasn't the only thing he did. Richard Owen also deliberately misrepresented the facts regarding pterosaurs, too. He knew about Archaeopteryx and was trying to, dis, trying to dismiss Archaeopteryx as being a fossil. He just called Archaeopteryx a weird bird and said that all of the things that Darwin had predicted in advance of, of before Archaeopteryx had been discovered, Darwin said that if, Dar, if birds had evolved from dinosaurs, then we should find a fossil bird that had unfused wing fingers. <laughs> Shut up, dogs. So. Within two years of Darwin saying that, they discovered Archaeopteryx lithographica. Now, this was lithographica because it's a lithographic skeleton, meaning the entire thing is there. Uh, an animal falls dead in, in, in thin mud such that the, the, the entire thing is preserved like, uh, you know, like a press plate, like, a, like an engraving, so you don't okay. miss any of it. So in this case the, the head of the thing had been torn off but it was enough that that, that you know before that it had been lithographically printed but there was a, there was enough there to tell what this is and a number of creationist well, scientists later declared that archaeopteryx was a fraud that it was actually compsonathus which is a non-avian yeah. dinosaur that somebody had simply glued feathers onto it and there was a couple of uh, like um well it doesn't matter you know, fred hoyle was one of those uh, one of the few who announced that Archaeopteryx was a fraud, that somebody had literally glued feathers onto a dinosaur just to make it look like it was becoming a bird. Right. But already we can tell if, if, if that's all it takes to, to, to turn a dinosaur into a bird, then we already have a problem, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> and well, the fact well, is that Archaeopteryx skeleton is virtually identical to that of, an Archaeopter of, a, of a Compsonathus and distinctly different from that of, say, a chicken because chickens have a keeled sternum, which Archaeopteryx did not have. Only paleonates, and this is an important part of the name, paleonates, ostriches and emus and rays and cassowaries, do not, they don't have a keeled sternum. They have a flat sternum like we do. So they don't have the, this extra fin in the middle to build on larger pectoral muscles for flying. So there are, really? there are flying paleonates. There's one called the tinamou. That's the only surviving species that can still fly. And they fly very poorly and they don't fly very far because they don't, well. this, they don't have this, they don't have this rib <clears throat> on here. What they do have is fingers. Cool. So on an emu, for example, and I had a pet emu living in my backyard for three years. 
until my neighbors complained because my neighbors were and they 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 made me turn the, the city eventually came by and told me that you you know there is a law against having ratites we you know we put up with you having this no prehistoric you know you what's that <laughs> i said no prehistoric animals <laughs> exactly <laughs> i used to take my emu for walks down to the park <laughs> and it's <laughs> And it, it's it's really funny because he was for the longest time. I had him for three years, and we would do this like twice a week at least. Yeah. He and I would walk down the sidewalk to the park, and the Pretty police cool. complained that I didn't have him on a leash. I'm like, you can't put a emu on a leash. <laughs> that shit didn't work. You know, there's just no way to do that. So he and I would just simply walk unrestrained That's side by side down to the park and I would get to the street that you have to cross the street to get to the park and put my arm out in front of him to, to block him. And then when it was clear to go, I'd move my arm back and he and I would go across the street. And as soon as his feet touched the grass, he'd do this weird thing with his head and take off like Roadrunner in the cartoons. And he was stunningly fast. I mean, did so he, did fast. Did he tell you about Liberty Mutual? <laughs> <laughs> or is that like a similar bird? Is that a, I don't know. I just, I started thinking about the Liber Liberty Mutual bird. Yeah, I, I didn't see that commercial. Like wearing glasses but and shit. I, there, was a, there was these, a bunch of kids, you know, like middle school kids or whatever, uh, that were playing around in the woods in the park. And my bird happened to be wandering around in the park. And I'm, I'm out there with him, you know, like trying to keep close to him. But he's, he's, off, in the, he's off in the weeds, yeah. having, having fun exploring shit. And he happens across these kids, or the kids happen across them, and they freak their shit because they said, it's a dinosaur. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, it actually literally is a dinosaur. I mean, technically it's a bird, but it is literally a dinosaur. So one of the, one of the things about emus is they, have, they, don't, they don't have wings. They have arms. Right. They have arms just like a Tyrannosaurus does. And instead of having the two useless fingers that a Tyrannosaurus has, emu has only one. Okay. On the end of that arm is a finger, of course, and on the end of that finger, just one finger, is, and the end of that finger is a claw. But what's interesting, why would a bird have a claw on the end of its finger unless it's a vestigial limb, meaning it's a carryover from being a dinosaur, right? But the more interesting thing is it doesn't have muscles in those arms. It cannot move those arms. Why would you have a claw in an arm you cannot move. That is pretty interesting. Yeah. So that's just one of many myriad examples we've got for, for vestigial species, which a lot of people misunderstand. Vestigial species does not, or, or, sorry, vestigial features does not necessarily mean useless. It means it's no longer being used for its primary original function. It's being used for something else or it's a, 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 uh, a, a diminished original function. Like we still have canines. Damn, so no, no irreducible complexity. I mean, no. every argument, every argument that was made for irreducible complexity was disproved in a court of law after it had already been disproved in science. Everyone. I saw that. So, okay. So getting back to the dinosaur thing, I want to ask you this because I wanted to know your thoughts on this. Um, so for the layman's out here, um, do you think dinosaurs were warm-blooded and were they reptilians? Oh yeah, that's. I'm sorry, I've got on. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, it's all good. It's it's yeah. it's a big subject, but yeah. R Richard Owen realized they were warm-blooded, and really? that yes, that jacked with his reality because he had this belief system that warm-blooded animals, and we we still have some rem residue of this. You know, the, we have the the, the idea of being warm-blooded means loving and caring and nurturing, whereas cold-blooded is just methodical killers, right? So right. he was the one that presented this idea. And when, when they discovered moas, with the, like the giant Australian moa, which is also a paleonate like an emu, it's, just an, it's an emu that's like 11 feet tall, but it's, an, it's basically an emu. And he realized that these are very similar to the dinosaurs that they were pulling up. And there were a lot of features in the bones of the dinosaurs that were different than lizards or crocodiles, your turtles, your basic cold-blooded reptiles. And these were, these were the type of features that are exclusively found on warm-blooded animals. So he came to realize he knew that dinosaurs were warm-blooded, but he didn't want other people to know that because it with his artificial reality that he had made up for himself, where God was a tinkerer and had to, where, where God had let all of the iguanodons wear out and die and replaced them all with cows. And, and, and all of the, uh, the, uh, 
the megalosaurus. Oh, is it megalosaurus? Yeah, me megalosaurus was what the, one of the ones that he had, that he, he had taken apart in that discovery, at least in naming the thing. Uh, megalosaurus is like a giant version of a velociraptor. Cool. And so he it was one of the first carnosaurs that, that was ever discovered. And so he he had a, no idea what the f a, a megalosaur looked like because the, the skeleton they had found was so small. Or yeah. was, there was so, there was so many there was just so few fragments of it. There wasn't enough to see that this is like a giant ostrich shaped thing just with vicious claws. Right. So it wasn't bird like. like we, we know that velociraptors are very bird like, and it turns out that 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 uh, Jurassic Park <laughs> up because. All velociraptors and all of the other uh, theropod dinosaurs that are similar to velociraptors. All of them are completely feathered. Feathered. Every one of them is completely. really yes, all of them. Because they yeah, because they made them cold-blooded reptiles in Jurassic Park, and you're saying that that's nothing like the reality. The reality is they were all warm-blooded, and they were uh, they were fully feathered. They were big ass big birds. They were birds. If, if, you've, if you'd seen one in real life, you would think they were birds until they begin to rip you to pieces. <laughs> so getting back to, okay, um, that's funny as hell, by the way. Um, but I wanted to get back to, uh, for our viewers, um, the transitional uh, fossils and the ape to man fossils. So, and this is probably another layman's question here as someone who, isn't a scientist, uh, but somebody who's just a fan of evolution or learning about evolution. Um, so why aren't the transitional ape to men here today? I mean, we, you know, we have chimps, we have, um, you know, various types of humans. Why aren't the intermediates uh, found in isolated groups across the world or even Neanderthals. Why don't we see them? Various in? types of humans? You said we have various types of humans? Well, you know, different races and stuff like that, but we, we don't actually, really We actually don't. Okay, what do you mean? We, there's only one race. Right. Well, we, and, and we Darwin himself was, race. Dar Darwin himself was the first one to point this out. Okay. There is only one race of okay. humanity. The differences that we that we see, it, and, and this is this is the answer to your problem, the, the question okay. actually. One group of people uh, develop because of the, the 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 environment that they that they live in. You know, they they develop this epicanthal fold that other people that not everybody else has. Uh, other group of people because they live in sub-Saharan Africa where they live in the tropics, they develop darker skin, which is an aid. So to preventing sun cancer or you know, you know skin cancer right right because if you're in the tropics the sun is directly over you and it's intense and so you have to protect yourself against that right uh, and this is also one of the reasons that we have hair on our heads but not hair on the rest of our bodies if that makes okay. any sense the hair on our heads shades our skull but they didn't it doesn't work the same effect on the rest of our body the rest of our body needs to be able to sweat okay yeah so the the differences between us are are pathetically meaningless Right. If you look back in the past, if you go back 100,000 years or more, then you find other races. You have Neanderthals and you have Denisovans. Okay. Yeah. And so Denisovans are one that we just discovered recently. Uh, and they, they found a finger bone in okay. a cave. And when they found genetic material in that finger bone, they thought that they were going to find, they were going to determine whether it was human or whether it was Neanderthal. That's what they were initially intending to, to, to realize. And, and then they found that it's neither one. Okay. It was something completely different. And then when they were doing, like everybody does the 23 and me, right? So all these people around the world are getting their, their genome tested. And there were a number of people in Melanesia whose uh, genetic signature included a different genome than everybody else in the world had. And it matched the finger bone that was found in the cave in Denisova. Wow. So Denisovans had interbred with the ancestors of Melanesians, whereas uh, everybody that came out of Africa, you know, there's one channel that comes out of Africa that goes through the Middle East, and the, the Neanderthals were heavy in the Middle East and in Europe. So everybody that comes out of Africa, whether they're going to Asia or whether they're going to Europe, they have some integration with the Neanderthals. So we have typically 1% or 2% of Neanderthal DNA. The absolute most that anybody can have is 4% of Neanderthal DNA. 
of Neanderthal DNA. And people in sub-Saharan Africa don't have any because their ancestors never went through that corridor and therefore never interbred okay. with Neanderthals. All right. Thank you for explaining that. Um, I still am kind of curious, though, because there are lesser forms, uh, even lower than Neanderthals, but still above chimpanzees that don't exist anymore. Examples like Lucy uh, and so on. How come they're not here today or how come we can't find them on the earth in, in genetically isolated groups somewhere? Because at any point in paleo history, period, yeah. regardless when you're looking at 99% of species have gone extinct. Damn. That's it's just always the case. If you went back, as I said, if you went back like 10 million years, there would be 50 different species of apes living across Africa, Asia, and Europe. Europe. Because you know, I mean, for the creationists, they would say, well, that's very convenient. That 50 different species, none of which exist today? Well, yeah, no, that none of the transitionals are really around anymore, and it's pretty much just us humans. But they're still in the fossil record, and there's every transitional we need, everyone that was ever predicted. With one exception, I predicted that we would find a transition between Mixopsorician Eurypterids and Arachnids, because I challenged the contention that uh, Arachnids arose separate from Eurypterids. I think that Arachnids arose within Eurypterida, and that all, all scorpions and all spiders should therefore be counted as Eurypterids. Mm. Okay. I have talked to some some paleoentomologists who say that my idea has credence. So, okay. if we ever discover that, that's one of the few things that we're still looking for. Okay, all right. The important thing is we need to understand what evolution is. And evolution in, in this summary, uh, summary def definition is descent with inherent modification. Now, okay. creationists lie because the creationist position is entirely based on frauds, falsehoods, and fallacies, and not one word of truth. So one thing that they have to do is misrepresent what evolution is. So they want one thing to give birth to another fundamentally different thing, which never happened anywhere in paleo history. And they know that, and they don't care because they has this, it's all about make-believe. So it's all about lying to people to convince them of something that was never true. Okay. Everything in evolution is just a mod. Every new species or genus or whatever was just a modified version of whatever its ancestors were. So everything fits into a subgroup and then creates a new subgroup and a new subgroup, but it still, it still belongs to every other subgroup. So okay. anybody that's interested in looking this up, I did a series called The Systematic Classification of Life. And it's, it'll probably be 50 series, 50 episodes or more when it's done. I think I've only uploaded 47 episodes so far. And it covers our entire evolution from molecules to man, based on uh, the genetic signature and the fossil evidence and you know, you know, the, the, the uh, derived synapomorphies that we've established so far. Okay. Evolution is a process that we watch happen. And the, 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 the most obvious example that people always bring up is how we can affect changes in dogs. Now, artificial selection works in the, uses the same processes as natural selection, but kind of in, a, in the opposite way, because we do selective breeding for our purposes, not for the purposes of the organism. So the organism ends up losing when we do the selection. So ducks, for example, we get Peking ducks where suddenly the ducks are they're too big and fat and the wings are too short, they can't fly anymore. But they're much better for us to eat <laughs> because right. we've selected them that way. Natural selection favors the organism and works to get whatever improvement is for the organism. And, and, and natural selection obviously would never select for a duck to be better for us to eat. It, they, right. they, they, want to, they want to select for the duck to be better at reproducing, which means it has to be able to live long enough to reproduce. Right. And so most of evolution doesn't actually have to do with natural selection. Most of it doesn't. Natural selection has to, sele has to select on genetic variants. So genetic drift is actually the prime, uh, the, the, the prime directive, the, the prime selection, fee, or it's the, the, the prime evolutionary mechanism. Darwin couldn't figure that out because he didn't know about genetics. So he wrote that he, he couldn't figure this, what was the inheritable traits from, from, parent, from mother and father that was inherited into the, into the young 
that gave them this, this variation by which natural selection could work. And uh, Gregor Mendel, who was a, a, a monk, was doing experiments with pea plants, and he was the one that eventually discovered genetics. And he wrote to Darwin saying that he had found his, his answer. But for whatever reason, Darwin never, uh, never, never read uh, and, and understood that, that Gregor Mendel had answered that, that mystery. <clears throat> and in fact, the scientific community didn't discover it for, for decades. Somebody else had discovered genetics later on, and then somebody else had resurfaced, you know, you this thing you just discovered, and I know you're really happy about this. This other guy discovered it 30 years ago, and we just didn't notice okay. because nobody read his papers. So. Okay. All right. Well, this has been really educational. Um, there are, uh, you know, there's, there are some things to me that seem interesting about the Bibles. Uh, here I go. <laughs> I know you're ready. Um, there's a couple of things that have interested me about the Bible's interpretation of how life came about, and it does seem to match discoveries uh, in science and evolution. Let me let me explain, and maybe you can correct me here. Because I'm mystified, uh, obviously. I'm yeah, I, I I see I see you getting started. <laughs> um, okay, so it talks about the creation, uh, the days of creation which we know that word, the Hebrew word, doesn't actually mean day, but it talks about the gradual progress of life on the planet, and it talks about how things were, the Bible talks about in Genesis 1, how things were uh, in the water first, and plants... Yeah, let the earth bring forth. And, yeah, and then this, things this. started to come onto land, and then man was the last thing created, and I mean, isn't that, isn't that kind of how it played out, though? The, the Bible gets the sequence wrong. Was Which it? Is I mean, problem. is that is that correct though? I mean, did it? You could, if you wanted to be very creative yeah. with your interpretation, and a yeah. lot of people are, and and the, the Christian scientists who ad, who are champions of evolution. And I'm not pushing for either way. I'm not taking sides here. I'm just okay. Just just understand that creationism yeah. denies evolution and denies methodological naturalism. Literally denies scientific methodology. Okay. But theistic <clears throat> evolutionists are scientifically trained Christians who accept evolution and their interpretation of the Bible is that God said, let the earth bring forth these things after their own kind, which is a perfect example of cladistic phylogenetics. Creationists refuse to accept that because it means that we are apes. But you know what? I'm sorry. We are apes. We can prove that we are apes. Worse than that, we can prove that we are monkeys. Not just that we came from monkeys, but that we are still monkeys right now. Interesting. The weird fact, uh, I've argued with a number of creationists about this. You, you take any of the, and, and my, my series talks about 70 different named clades in our ancestry. And if you give the criteria for any of these ancestral clades, you're describing people. Obviously, if you, if you describe vertebrates, you're describing people, right? What, what is a vertebrate? It's an you know, animal right. that has a backbone. What, what is an animal? An animal uh, is a multicellular eukaryote that has an internal digestive tract. Well, obviously, you are a multicellular. You, all your cells are eukaryote, including your blood cells, are initially you know, have an internal nucleus, and they, except they lose them later, but initially they have a nucleus. So you're still a eukaryote. And you can't argue that in any of the sequences, Okay. Any of the 70 different clades, ancestral clades that we belong to. When you get to describe what a mammal is, you're describing what a, what a person is. You're describing people. When you describe what a monkey is, the criteria that applies to all monkeys without making exceptions for certain ones, you describe people. Okay. When you describe a certain subset of that being the old world monkeys, you describe people. When you describe the criteria of another subset of old world monkeys being the apes, you describe people. When you describe it a subset of apes called the great apes, you're describing people. Okay. And it keeps going like that. So there was okay. never, ever, 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 ever a point where one thing turned into another different kind of thing. And there's no such thing as a kind. And to prove that, I made another video called the phylogeny challenge. It's the death knell, death knell for creationism because if there was any truth to creationism at all, or okay. if there was a fundamental flaw in evolution, then there would have to be a way to answer the phylogeny challenge, which is simply identifying where the kinds are. I ask a handful of yes or no questions. Just go through the yes or no questions, and when you answer no, mark that 
and explain why and how you know it. Because that was one thing that always kind of kept me going in between and wondering which one was true because I would look at things like bacteria because people who were atheists and believed in evolution, they'd say, well, look at bacteria. It evolves several times an hour. And I would always say, but it stays bacteria. And, and it, it always will. It doesn't evolve into another thing. It stays bacteria. Right. And, and, and we never stopped being apes and we'll yeah. never stop being apes. And birds never stopped being dinosaurs. And see, they will never stop that, being dinosaurs. Okay, see, and I would always use that as uh, an explanation for why I felt like evolutionists uh, could not explain the mechanisms of how macroevolution happens. Now, I believe in adaptation. Okay, well, well, let's, let's, talk about about what, macro. let's talk about what adaptation is. Okay. Because I think you're confusing adaptation with microevolution. I thought and, those were the same thing, to be honest. No. Adaptation is good. Look, give me an idea about adaptation. Remember what I mentioned about if, you, if your family lives in, in, in the tropics for several generations, your babies are going to be born with darker skin. And right. this is just a, this is a natural, re this is an adaptation to the environment. That's not microevolution, it's not macroevolution. Microevolution is when you create Hundreds of different breeds of dogs re recognized by the uh, American Kennel Club, for example, or, or when you have seven different species of tiger, th four of which are already extinct and the other three are endangered. But you have seven different species of tiger. These are all within, it, all of these can interbreed if you were to put them together. They're all chemically interfertile and they're willing to interbreed, which is another one of the, when you were talking about sexually reproductive animals, you know, one of the criteria is will they, not just can they, but will they in a natural environment? You know, when you put an animal under stress, it'll do things that it wouldn't do in the, in the wild and so forth. Right. So microevolution, the simplest way to put that is variation within a species so that you can have okay. a number of traits that appear in one group that are not shared with any member of the other group. Like you can, you start with bloodhounds yeah. and you, you create from bloodhounds, basset hounds. So you've got a bloodhound with short legs. And then you take that basset hound and you make it even smaller designed for hunting badgers in tunnels. And now you've got a dachshund, right? So okay. basset hound to, or, or the bloodhound to basset hound to dachshund. Okay. Right, so you you can see how that works, and one one can emerge out of the other, or they don't necessarily have to. They can all they can all come from a, a a sister group. Okay, that's variation within a species. Macroevolution is variation between species, meaning speciation when a new species emerges, and the difference is that when a new species emerges, let let's say that. Uh, a, you have one population and, and they, they get isolated. No, that's one of the, that's, there, are, there are at least four different types of speciation that have been directly observed under control conditions and categorized. Um, one of the most common ones, this is one, of course, when you separate, I don't know if you can hear that or not. Yeah, uh, when you it. separate, <laughs> there's a dog <laughs> chewing a chew toy and nobody's controlling the dog. The dog has <laughs> something to say about this. <laughs> Hello, honey. Macroevolution, yes. Yeah. So speciation is when you have one population, let's say they're divided uh, ge geographically. Yeah. Uh, and like ring species are a great example of this. So you'll have, you'll have species that, uh, species of salamander that go around the San Fernando Valley, for example, or you have uh, species of tern that go around the entire Arctic Circle. And so you'll, you'll have a number of different collective species where that appear all around that, that map and species A can breed with species B and species B can breed with species C. But when it goes all the way around to F or G, those can't breed with species A anymore because they're too genetically distinct. And that's because genetic drift, the variation. So this is what, and this is what you're saying. This is what we have observed that yes. you feel convinces you that macroevolution... No, that we, we can it, prove that we, we've directly observed macroevolution many different ways, okay. both in the lab and in naturally controlled conditions in the field. So, okay. and creationists accept that speciation happens. They admit that speciation happens, but they refuse to accept what speciation is or what macroevolution is and that they are in fact the same thing. What happens feel, when... What I happens was just going to ask... Yeah, I was going to ask real quick. Um, so, hypothetically speaking, do you think that if time went on long enough, 
that as we have observed this macro evolution, that these creatures could become something completely different entirely uh, millions of years from now. Evolution is descent with inherent modification. Okay. So they will never be completely different than they will always belong to whatever categories their ancestors did. That's why we are still apes. Why is that? I mean, just, you know, why will we always belong? Uh, how come we can't change entirely into something else? Why do we have those okay, genetic okay. limitations if macroevolution can, in fact, happen? Because evolution is descent with inherent modification, meaning that every new genus or species is just a modified version of whatever its ancestors were. Okay. Evolution is not about can never turn an elephant into a fish. Okay. Just you out know, of or, curiosity. Or a pine tree or whatever. That creationists want that to happen. question or, or, here. Why not? Okay. Because evolution is descent with inherent modification, meaning that every new genus or species is just a modified version of whatever its ancestors were. And you're saying so, that genetically it won't be – you're saying it will have genetic limitations to where it cannot change into something else entirely. Like you said, an elephant to a tree. It's not just genetic – it's not just genetic limits. Okay, so if, if a mouse gave birth to a pine tree – <laughs> would we would we be able to say that the pine tree had any relationship to the mouse? No, right. there's there's no genet, there's no trace of that. Literally, there's no trace. Now, when you get the even genome, over time, it doesn't matter. We can we can check the DNA the the DNA of okay. people and compare that to the DNA of other apes and other monkeys and so forth. And what we find is that we share a lot of the same genes. We can find the genes that we have that they don't, and we can find the parrot genes that we share with them. And some of the ones that we have that we share with the other apes and monkeys are interesting in that we have defects, that we still have defective genes. This should not exist. Why would, if we were created, why right. would we have defective monkey genes? Genes that work in monkeys, but that don't work in us. They, they may produce a protein, but the protein doesn't work, or it's the okay. wrong protein, and it has an adverse effect. One of them being a tumor suppressor gene that was lost or, or deactivated in people. And the result of that is that we are more susceptible to brain cancer, but wow. another side effect of that is that it causes our brains to grow larger, larger than any other monkey. Wow. And that's a defect that caused that. Another one of our defects. That we're so intellectual. <laughs> another one of the defects of genes, one of the yep. monkey genes. And there's, there's, there's a lot of regulatory genes that we have with monkeys that don't work in us. We still have those genes. And we right. would not have them if we were created. Why would God give us defective monkey genes? Why would God give us the same genes he gave it to monkeys, but that they don't work in us? That they're broken and don't do anything in us. Why would God give us ERVs in common with apes and in common with monkeys? Showing that our ancestors, in common with the monkey ancestors, suffered through the same diseases and that they, they, they developed those antibodies and that this was encoded into their, their DNA. There's, there's no reason for that. A God, a creator God would not have done that unless he wants to lie to us. <clears throat> I'm definitely a skeptic of the Bible, so a lot of this I, I can definitely sympathize with. Um, it, so, it's, it's important also to look at the fact that the Bible is just one collection of man-made mythology, right? and that it's not the earliest one, that there are other older myths that the Bible is largely based on, the books of... The, I actually, I agree with that. I feel like the Bible has borrowed from a lot of older legends, so I agree with you on that. I do. Yeah. I do. So evolution is something that we can we can see happening we control it we use it in agriculture every day uh we, not just with dog breeders but uh with everybody that that, that breeds uh farm animals that everybody everybody that breeds corn you know corn was developed from a type of grass called teosinte and the difference between teosinte and corn is five genes five mutations well and so these and so ancient people were literally eating grass and picking the ones that were the most edible 
and planting those better ones. Wow. And there's and, and so they get one that has bigger seeds or more more uh, more digestible stock or whatever. And so after just five mutations, we get corn. Now the problem with it with this is when you do uh, when you do too much uh, breeding too fast. Okay. Because the when you do the old fashioned type of of uh, sampling gen, before anybody knew anything about genetics, when they're just selecting for the features that they want, right? They have you know still a thousand years of this new species to develop its uh, its its uh, relationship with the rest of the environment when we have like 10 new crops of different types of species of corn in a decade they don't have that and sometimes they they lose some of their uh their adaptive advantages okay of what the old versions of corn had because as a natural selection doesn't work for the organism it works for us okay whereas art i'm mean, sorry artificial selection when yeah, people no. yeah yeah it's natural like selection works it. for the organism <laughs> <laughs> thank you yeah no it's all good um there's actually there's two more things i wanted to talk about um i want to talk a little bit about a biogenesis and then i want to talk a little bit about what i currently believe and uh i wanted to hear your thoughts on that because i'm sure you'll have a lot to say on anything where the word believe is involved. <laughs> so, yeah, I want to ask you a little bit about a biogenesis. Um, what, do you th well, what do you think about a biogenesis? Abiogenesis was originally conceived yeah. by uh, Rudy Virchow. Who's because isn't that, you know, just and just for everyone watching, um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Arn, because you'd know better than I would, but isn't that our best hypothesis as as to how non-life uh, or life arose from non-life it's actually a dozen different hypotheses okay All yeah right. so so rudy virchow came up with this idea uh and and a lot of people get and this is a this is a sad thing when you look it up in the dictionary no dictionary that i've ever seen has been able to make the distinction because they're all written by christians i guess and so they, they can't right. seem to distinguish spontaneous generation from abiogenesis they are not even related. The dictionary will tell you they're one and the same thing. They're not. Are spontaneous, one true? spontaneous generation was came up with by uh, Steno, who said that who believed in this theory of vitalism you know, back when theories and science could still be disproved. Now nowadays the criteria is much higher. There hasn't been a disproval of a scientific theory in more than a hundred years. Really? It, essentially. Nowadays, the criteria is that a, a scientific theory can be viewed in very simple terms as being a hypothesis that has been effectively proven by being verified by so many different trials and tests and so forth and, and never being contradicted once. It's been tried and tested, and it's gotten to the point where there's so much support, there's so much evidence supporting that, that it would be perverse to question it anymore. Because isn't the, um, and you've talked about this experiment many times, but, uh, and again, I could be wrong here, but the experiment where they took the amino acids and zapped it with electricity, wasn't that related to uh, an experiment of a biogenesis of how life could arise from non-life and they tried it, they failed it, et cetera, et cetera? They created the uh, the amino acids. They didn't start with the amino acids. Okay. So they started with with base chemicals of what they what they expected of a prebiotic earth, and they did a number of different experiments with different chemical constructs. So the first experiment that Yuri uh, I, Yuri Miller, okay. uh, the yeah. Yuri Miller experiments, the first ones that they did were based on the first hypothesis of a prebiotic earth, and those did produce. Uh, amino acids. So they 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 created this environment. There's a complete. There was no oxygen. And they have all these vacuum tubes, but but they also had the, they had methane and they had uh, some organic compounds because organic chemistry does not mean that it has organs. It doesn't mean that it's alive. So that's one of those things that people keep misrepresenting. I, I hate when you look up organic food. All food is organic. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's all made of organic chemistry. Uh, so, but but then they they said, well, wait, but the, we don't think that the, pre, that the prebiotic Earth was was in this chemical construct anymore. We think it was. Now, mind you, his his experiment produced amino acids. Right. It was successful. Um, and so they came back later and they said, well, we think that the the prebiotic Earth was more like this. So they did the experiment again, and this time it was called volcano in a bottle. 
just out of curiosity, and like I said, I mean, you know, uh, why didn't it produce life? Because it's a multi-stage process. Okay. Life is extremely complex biochemistry. And so you are not going to like, you know, mix in a powder of different things, add right. a drop of water, and poof, it turns into life. You know, it, okay. it, it's not like that. There are so many different constituent or, or sequential steps to get to. That's the thing that kind of confuses me. Uh, if if we're so confident in it, how come we cannot uh, conduct any successful experiment that can produce life from non-life? You mean why didn't we? Why didn't Craig Venter create a living or, or organism in his lab out of base materials, which he did a decade ago, or why didn't people create a lifelike membrane that has uh, homeostasis, which they did a month ago, uh, or 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 like any of those other instances where where people have done exactly that? The, the more the more important thing is that we had to figure out how nature did it. And so we have to figure out how, how did nature come with, with the prebiotic earth chemicals and build these increasingly complex macromolecules to get to the point where they are life. So we have to come up with the construct of DNA. And how do we know where did DNA come from? Well, RNA actually builds DNA. Okay. So, we have to, so we have to come up with what created RNA to build the DNA. And we found a number of things where RNA can be created by itself, without, even without an enzyme. You just put it in the right chemical environment. If you put it in contact with montmorillonite clay under the right chemical circumstances, it'll, it will automatically self-catalyze into RNA monomers. Now, how do you get the base chemicals that start that? Well, then that's another premise, of, which gets back to the Uri Miller thing. So you start back to, with, with the volcano in the bottle. You create the amino acids. And then there's the next experiment, which takes the amino acids to the next more complex stage. And then there's another type of experiment that takes the next complex stage, and so on, until we get to RNA, which then creates DNA. And then all we have left are some of the organelles. We have to figure out some of how the organelles came about. And what you mentioned you said, bacteria. Um what you said was actually very interesting a minute ago, and I just want to make sure that I heard this correctly because uh, it kind of blew my mind, and I'm sure the viewers watching will be pretty surprised by this too. So you're saying that successful experiments have now been conducted where they have taken non, you know, they've created basically they've created life from non-life. They've definitely done this at this point. Life has seven criteria. And what they've most recently constructed uh, was fantastic in that uh, they had something that has homeostasis. They had they created, for lack of a better term, they created a virtual organism that moves and eats and has homeostasis. Homeostasis okay. is one of the important elements of life. It's one of the seven criteria that it has to have. Everything right. we've ever created before that was either... Uh, we, 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 can, we can assemble living, living organisms out of their base constituents and have them function, which, again, if, it, if creationism were a thing, that shouldn't be possible. But if they've done that, uh, what was more impressive is when they, when they create, uh, when, they, when they show how nature can automatically, under certain chemical conditions, produce the, the components that lead up to the next chemical stage, and then we have a, def have a, have a different hypothesis for how, to, how does it get from that stage to this stage, which is even more increasingly complex. And there was Has one any study- been done in the real world? All of these have been. Okay. All the things you that I'm talking You said something about, about virtual or uh, simulation, I just- When I say virtual, I mean almost there. So it has homeostasis, which is the one component that all previous examples did not have. So um, like for just example- for our, Yeah, for the sake of our viewers, what are the names of those experiments? Uh, so people could look those up. Anybody? I'll tell you what. I will. I, I I wrote a list. Uh, okay. I'll include the, the. I'll give you the paragraph. Okay. Of everything that I know about abiogen. It's a summary. It's a. It's as brief as I can make it. It's. It's still hundreds. <laughs> it's a <laughs> huge paragraph. Yeah, no, it's a complicated <laughs> subject. That's why I'm asking so many questions. I'm trying to make sure that me and the viewers understand this. Yeah, ab abiogenesis is actually very complex. Yeah. So when, when Rudy Virchow came up with this, this is an interesting thing. Uh, a lot of creationists will come up with it. The law of, the law of biogenesis, right? Well, yeah. that was Rudy Virchow's idea. He came up okay. with the law of biogenesis. He said that life comes from life. 
he said that cells come from cells, which and that's true. Both statements are true. Okay. But he also said that diseased cells come from diseased cells. And then somebody challenged him on that, 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 that there's, there's an infinite regress that doesn't work here. There had to be a point where a cell was not diseased, where it became diseased. And when he realized right. that there had to be a point where a cell had become, what well, was originally a healthy cell and become a diseased cell. Viruses, right? No, that's viruses are different. Viruses are not even alive because, okay. they, don't, because they don't have homeostasis. So they're an interesting thing in that they can be killed, but they're not alive. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, viruses represent a very interesting thing in, in that scientists don't know where to categorize them. Okay. They know that when life was developing, that there had to have been these intermediate stages where we're not quite left life yet. And so they have two stages called a hypercycle and a protobiont. And they think that viruses, some viruses could be an offshoot or a carryover or, or a continuation of the protobiont stage. Or they could be a reversion of that because evolution goes in every direction. It doesn't always can become more complex. It very often goes the other way. Uh, the evolution is only about creating diversity, not necessarily increasing complexity. Although when you make everything as diverse as possible, eventually you're going to make something more complex. How come you don't, how come we don't see new life arising all the time? You know, how come we don't walk past ponds, pools or whatever? Probably dumb question, but you know, how come we don't see new life appearing all the time? The way that Darwin described that yeah. you know, 150 years ago would be if that process is still going on and it might be, then the, there are so many different con constituent components to build up to that, that these are all just going to be organic materials that will inevitably be consumed before they become a new life form. Even in, in, even in simulated or uh, laboratory experiments? We, we could do laboratory experiments and, ex and eventually, because we've only started doing this within the last 50 years. Right. We've only just started doing this kind of research. So, another, and it's amazing that we keep in, our, our progress is in, is increasing with great rapidity, so okay. that what we what we get fifty years from now will not be twice what we had fifty years ago, or not be twice what it is now. It'll be a hundred times what it is now. You know, it's funny that you say that because um, John had a saying that I like, and uh, I told him he should use it more often. He said, uh, "Would you say, John, today's science is tomorrow's joke?" Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, I, I, I don't really like that because science works in, in like, much like playing the game of 20 questions. Yeah. Now, you, every question you ask, you may have the wrong conclusion, uh, the wrong reason for why you asked that question. Right. But nonetheless, your answer is going to help zero you in on that bullseye. Right. And so every question is going to keep zooming in closer and closer on what the truth is. And this is the primary difference between evolution or, or it really is a scientific perspective versus a faith-based perspective. And this is what this is really about. Science is something we can prove. If any of your listeners doubts that sincerely, I will be happy to prove evolution to their satisfaction. Okay. Simultaneously, as a side point, I will also prove that, that creationism is nothing but lies, that there's not one word of truth to it. And I have a very specific way to word that challenge. Name any uh, evolutionary scientist who ever uh, lied in the act of promoting evolution over creationism. Uh, show what that lie is, quote it verbatim, because I don't, you know, I, I don't want you to say Piltdown Man, because if that, if you, if that's that's not the name of a scientist for one thing, the, and and that also wasn't anything that that evolution did or that an that an evolutionary about, scientist uh, proposed. That it, it, well, Piltdown Man was a fraud that was perpetuated against the London Museum, so that was not a fraud that was perpetuated by evolution. That was 
against the scientists, and the scientists found out that they were being defrauded. They figured it out. They, they, they put away the skull for decades because it didn't match anything they were finding, and so they were like, "What? The, this doesn't match anything. We'll just squirrel this over here until we can figure it out. Right. And so somebody eventually later, decades later, figured out that when, now we have chemical tests that we can put to this thing. And once they started putting it to chemical tests, I was like, hey, now, we, now that we know how to age these things, now that we know how to do radiometric dating, let's dig out that Piltdown fossil and test that again. And that's when it was found out to be a fraud. But it was a fraud against the scientists, not a fraud of the scientists. Mm, okay. so I, just, I just want to be clarified about that. I get what you're saying. So n- name an evolutionary scientist who ever lied promoting evolution against creationism. You so I guess can't. the archaeopteryx wouldn't apply then in that case by the way you explain it. Darwin predicted it would be discovered. It was discovered. A number of people said it was a hoax, and five or six more fossils of that, of that species were discovered. So all of these people and they realized had feathers, eventually. Right? What's that? They, did they all have feathers? Not all of them. Okay. So there was, a, there was a couple that didn't. And the, but they're still lith- lithographic skeletons because of the type of the basin that they were found in. Okay. And even the ones that, di- that didn't, that were stripped of their feathers by ants or, or predators or whatever, they s- were still able to tell that this is not a Composonathus skeleton because the arms are too long. And the only thing that has a Composonathus skeleton, but the, the arms are ridiculously long like that, is Archaeopteryx. And so when they compared it to other Archaeopteryx skeletons that had already been found, they realized that even though this doesn't have a, the feathers still attached to it, that's what this is. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, now I want to talk a little bit about what I believe nowadays, and I want to get your take on it. And oh, I didn't, finish, I didn't finish that challenge. I only give you the first okay. part of it. Okay, let's hear it. Okay, so, so the first part was, name any evolutionary scientist who ever lied promoting uh, uh, evolution over creationism, and everybody's going to say Ernst Haeckel, but you're wrong, and, and I can show why, so, so don't even bother with that one. Okay. And if you want to talk about the guy who, uh, who, who discovered what he called um, Nebraska Man, uh, he, was not, so he was rejected by the entire scientific community. And he looked for five years for additional evidence to back up his claim and then had to concede that what he had found was actually a badly worn, badly decomposed tooth that wasn't really a human tooth. The entire scientific community turned him away and said, you ain't got shit unless you can prove it. All of them. Now, creationists will tell you that he fooled everybody. He fooled nobody but Kiss, not one person, not even his best friend who had to write an apology saying, hey, my friend was full of shit, had, a, had, had his head up his ass, was a little bit too ambitious about the shit that he said. Now, you notice how science has this criteria that the shit you say better be correct. You better be able to show that you're true. And creationism, make up whatever the f- you want, and it doesn't matter, right? No criteria at all. Oh, shit, huh? Oh. <laughs> exactly. So the second part of my challenge, name any professional creationist, somebody who actually makes his money by, by profiting creationism, who did not lie while promoting creationism over evolution. Now, here, here's, the, here's the other criteria that you need to know. <laughs> on, on the first one, on the first one, you will have to, you, na- you not only have to name the scientist, you also have to name the lie verbatim, okay? And we'll show that that's not actually the way it was. You will not ever find not one single scientist who ever lied in promoting evolution over creation ever not even one give up you won't creationist find one professional creationist all you got to do give me the name you don't even have to tell me what the lie is just tell me the name give me the name of the f-ed up f-ed snake oil salesman whatever one you want it doesn't matter. I'll show you how he lied. I've been doing this for two decades plus. I will, you just gave me the name. You, you, you want to say, Morris, I can show you a list of lies. Hovind, he's nothing but lies. He's a library of lies. Pam, <laughs> how did I know? of how lies. You know, he's a really nice guy if you talk to him. Who is? Oh, that's right, you already have. <laughs> <laughs> I talked yeah, to no, him. No, he's a complete he's a nice guy. He's, he's, oh. he's infected cheese. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
photo. <laughs> And I mean, I, I've, met his, really I've met his son guy. a handful of times. I've met his son a handful of times, and I have to say that the acorn doesn't fall far, doesn't fall far from the con man. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I don't know if I agree with his literal, yeah. Of, so that, I want to just, just to stress, because I've told this to a number of people, and the, the sad thing but is. But I like the guy. <laughs> the sad thing, and most other people don't. When they, when they know him personally, yeah, they come away with the because I've I've talked to a lot of people that have been on his compound, yeah, and have worked for him, or his own family. Talk to anyone in his family; they have all disowned him, every last one of them, including his oldest child, who was taken away from him by the rest of the family because Hovind refused medical treatment, and it caused permanent damage, oh, and wow. that's why the family took the kid away. So Hoven is a madman and a liar, and his kids are defective too. But everybody in creationism has to lie. And the sad thing is, creationists know that, and they're completely okay with it. I've gotten many admissions. I got an admission today, today, somebody was posting on my Facebook that you can't be moral unless you're lied to. Somebody posted that on my Facebook today, Damn. saying that if we don't have noble lies, to force people into compliance, then there's no way to control their morality. <laughs> and I have to say that, no, you're mispronouncing that. The thing that controls people's morality is pronounced law, not lie. <laughs> well, I mean, I would say that you definitely don't need religion or fear of God to be a moral person. I know a lot of people who are atheists, who are humanistic or, or good people. I really don't feel like that is a factor at all. I feel like some people are just uh, kind-hearted, and they just know what to do. That, that's true, because you, you, you also that's have that. atheists who are shitheads. That, uh, you yeah. really do. That's true. And, and, we, and how many examples do we need to see that fear of God does not prevent people from raping their own children? It's true. It's true. Yeah, I mean, we've got so many examples of that. Did you know that yesterday— I agree. That, I, I agree with that. I do. Yeah. So yesterday there were there was a, there was an evangelical uh, conference where they they admitted that <clears throat> hundreds of ministers of Protestant ministers hundreds of Protestant ministers were convicted of child sex crimes. Hundreds of them. That doesn't surprise me at all, especially given the sexual repression culture of a lot of religions. Uh, you know, we talked about Jehovah's Witnesses earlier, the Catholics, uh, Protestants. Uh, like you said, I mean it's. It's not surprising at all, especially in a culture where sexual identity and expression is greatly discouraged, prohibited, and monitored and controlled. You know, of course, you're going to have people that are repressing this to the point where their their frustrations are probably, and I'm not justifying it at all, as much as I'm saying it definitely needs to be considered as a factor, is, is probably not healthy emotionally. So I, I agree with that. I do. Yeah. And I just want to clarify again, that just as I said, that, that being atheist doesn't make you a good person. Right. Being religious doesn't make you evil. Right. Now, people, I've, I've known people who are genuinely good hearted, compassionate people. And because of their misleading upbringing, they think that because they're good, kind hearted, compassionate people, that they should be Christian. And so they become evangelical ministers. I know a guy who's an evangelical minister. <laughs> And yeah. I, I, I love him. He's a very, he's a genuine sweetheart. He, nothing he believes is true. Not a word of it. <laughs> but that doesn't I, make I him agree. not, a, that doesn't make him a bad guy. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so that's your challenge. Um, now I would like to, this is the final segment here. Uh, I know this has been a really long interview and I, I really appreciate your time. Um, I, I appreciate you putting up with me being so late. <laughs> no, no, it's all good. You know what, man? We're all human. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what I believe nowadays. And, you know, like I said, I, I definitely want to hear your commentary because I'm sure you you probably will have a couple things to say about this. So I identify nowadays as uh, primarily agnostic. So if you know anything about us, which I'm sure you know plenty about us, we we're not really convinced... Either way, now... Are you convinced that an actual deity really exists? 
I don't know, but I will say this. But so that means you're not convinced. If you don't know if you're convinced, you're not convinced. Okay, fair enough. Then you're an atheist. Well, then, okay. All right, well, here's where it gets tricky, though. So I do somewhat believe in law of attraction. Now, a lot of people will tell me, oh, well, if law of, law of attraction was real, how come you can't wish for a billion dollars right now? How come you can't live forever? How come you can't stay young forever? Here, now, here's my personal theory on it. Because the law of attraction works within the other laws. And I'm going to have to confess something that's probably going to be personally embarrassing. I don't know what you mean by the law of attraction. Okay, no problem. So the law of attraction... Because your description doesn't match what I would have thought that is. So Well, yeah, no, the law of attraction is speaking things into existence and wishing positive things. over. It's the kind of stuff that Joel Osteen talks about that he claims is Christian, but it, and it maybe kind of is, but it, it's just you speak good things, you speak positivity, and then it comes to you. The law, the universe, the laws of the universe bring it to you. Now, like I said, it... It doesn't work in the sense of violating the other laws of being able to live forever or fly, but it works within the other laws of bringing you what you want if you wish it into existence through positive vibrations. I'd like to know what you think about that, because I'm sure you uh, have an opinion on that. I, I've always been, <laughs> even when I was poor. You're like, this interview's over. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> uh, yeah, even, even when I was at my lowest points in my life. Yeah. Um, I've always had it better than other people. Okay. Even though throughout my youth, I was a complete shit. Okay. And I, I didn't realize what a bad person I was. You know, I, I always thought it was great, but I, I had to realize in retrospect, like every year of my life, I look back on who I was the year before, and I'm always ashamed of who I was one year ago. Now, just extrapolate that back over 20 or 30 years and imagine what a shitty person I was way back then. If I'm ashamed of myself over every year, that, mean, that means I'm improving, but it means I, I started out from a really bad place. So you feel like through your younger years, you were a bad person? Yeah, I, I would never have realized that because, you know, everybody that's, that's 20 years old thinks they know everything, right? And, 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 and you know, we... I we mean, all... without going into too much detail, without trying to pry or be nosy, uh, what do you think made you a bad person? You said selfishness. Uh, I happen to be a very good-looking young man. Okay. And that enabled me to get away with yeah. not having to even have a job for a long time. I mean, I would, I would walk into a party, I would meet the most beautiful woman there and, I, and, and that's it. I would just, you know, I, I would, I was very selfish okay. because I just got what I wanted. And, uh, and, and it, it, I didn't have a, I thought I had compassion for other people, but I didn't express it. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't concerned about other people's feelings. Now, the reason I bring that up yeah. is I was a complete shit for so much of my life. And I got away with stuff that I shouldn't have gotten away with. And I've, I've, I've grown, I've, I've improved, I would hope. You know, as I said, every year I look back at myself and who I was the year before. I'm in, and, and certainly when I look back over the last decade, and I tell a lot of people of this, if I, if I could meet myself when I was 20, I'd whoop that kid's ass. <laughs> I mean, even looking at you now, you look like somebody who's very rough around the edges, who doesn't mind uh, saying what's on his mind. But if you get past the hardened exterior, you seem like a, a, a generally good guy. You're very humanistic, like you say, and you, and you do. You seem like the type of person who would give somebody the the coat off your back. Well, well, thank you. But there was there was points in my life where I was very selfish, where okay. I, I was only concerned about my own needs. And it didn't even occur to me how I was using people or manipulating people to get what I want. Right. Okay. So, and yet I've always felt blessed. Okay. I'm an atheist and I feel blessed. Things have always worked out for me. Things have always worked out well for me. Even when I was a shit, things <laughs> have still worked out well for me. Okay. I mean, I would be homeless and you know, I'm not kidding. I, I, I found myself dropped off in, a, in this town that I didn't know. <laughs> And, and I'm like, okay, well, now, I mean, I'm mean, hitchhiking, right? So I get dropped off in this town I don't even know, but I happen to find out that there's a Rocky Horror Picture Show playing that night. <laughs> so funny. I go to the Rocky Horror Picture Show knowing 
that I'm going to pick up a girl in the Rocky Horror Picture Show and I'm going to have to set, I'll have a place to sleep that night. And that's exactly what happened. Wow. And that was just, I would just do that. That's just the that's way that. things worked. So things worked out for, well for me, even though I was a shit. Now, conversely, I've known a hell of a lot of people who were always better humans than I was in some capacity, but have, who have always dealt with absolute torment in their lives. My, my baby brother, for example, who probably had the worst life of anybody that I've ever known. That guy can't catch a break. Everything has gone right and wrong in his life. Now, we didn't live together ever. You know, we've probably seen each other 25 times in the course of our lives. Wow. But every time I've ever spoken to him, his life is complete shit. Why? Okay, so he's, he's the believing Christian. Why, why, why is life always shitting on him in every possible way and always on, huge le always on a level beyond what I could even manage? Terrible crap happens to him on a regular basis that I've never had to endure. How does that work with your law of attraction? Well, actually, it, it might work with my law of attraction, and I'll tell you why I think it could. Um, maybe your outlook created a certain level of vibrations, your positive outlook, and, and knowing that you were going to land on your feet. Maybe your uh, brother um, didn't feel that way. Maybe he felt doomed, and maybe the negative vibrations or negative energy pushed him away from opportunity or the, you know, made the universe. Mm. You're right. That's, that's, that's what I'm saying. So I, I like your hypothesis, but the, the yeah. reality is that when I was in my twenties, I, I mean, you like were confident, you believed it. So there it is. It happened. Uh, what, right? I, when I was in my, I can show you pictures from my old photo album. I may look like a greasy old bastard now, but uh, when I was in my twenties, I looked like a combination of Brad Pitt and Johnny Depp. I, oh, I remember. I've seen pictures of you uh, where you were younger. And uh, yeah, that's kind of creepy. <laughs> no, no, I did. I saw a picture where you were making fun of Jesus and you dressed up like Jesus. You remember that picture? Yes. And I was 33 were, for that. It picture. was what? I was 33 for that picture. Okay. Wow. I'm 36. So you were three years. Okay. Yeah. No, no. I mean, you know, it seemed appropriate. That was Jesus's age at the time. I mean, you were, you were a great looking guy, Aaron. You were no, uh, I don't mean that in any kind of way, but yeah, no, no you, homo. Yeah, right. No homo. <laughs> um, you know, not, not that, that that fun. matters anymore. You're right. Not we're we're well into the 21st century, and that right. just, I, I would I would like to think that we we've, we've reached a level in our society where we don't have to categorize whether somebody is gay or straight. I feel actually kind of peculiar in that I am completely straight. I, I feel peculiar about that because like everybody's bi now. Right. Well, I mean, you know, it's like they say, man, whatever floats your water. Well, they used to say that you were either gay or you're straight. And then we realized, well, there's this whole bi category. And right. there's actually and more categories. Bi, so it's not even in two directions. It's now in, in, in this direction as well. And, and everybody's in a bell curve. So that most people are actually kind of bi. Yeah. And there's very few of us that are up here on this far edge. And I'm, I'm one of those peculiar ones that are up here in this far edge. He's becoming rare, man. Exactly. <laughs> Got to get with the times, bro. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I remember. Hey, I remember hey, saying, hey, society's evolving, man. Yeah, I remember right. saying when I was uh, when I was in my mid twenties. I, uh, I remember telling somebody if I was if I was by, shit would be so much easier. I'd have any, so many more date options on a Saturday night. There you go. <laughs> That's funny as hell. So you know, on the on the thing about uh, yeah. the, the law of attraction that you right right. About, I mean, the the fact that shitty people and, and we don't even have to be talking about myself. So just the fact that shitty people do great, and good people have terrible things happening to them, without any sense of justice. And then there, I can give specific examples that are really horrific. Well, yeah, no, you're right. And I've seen a lot of your videos where you talk about it. And I kind of agree with you. And here's where things kind of get weird for my belief system. I am somewhat of a believer of law of attraction, but I'm not really a believer of karma. And that's where things can get kind of tricky, because I do believe that bad people who believe that they're going to succeed can kill off and do whatever the hell they want. And good people who don't really believe in themselves or their power or vibrations or whatever, no matter how good they are, that karma 
won't come back to them. It won't do them anything. They will die. It's sad, and I'm not I'm not justifying it, and I, I hate to see people suffer, but it's a personal, I guess you could say it has been my personal observations. No, I'm not crazy. But it's been it's been my per, I feel like it's I I'm being subjective here. Uh, I feel like it's been my personal observations in society. I used to believe in karma, and it was the last thing that I continued to believe in when I when I lost faith in everything else. I really wanted to believe in karma. I wanted to believe that when that if you're a good person, to, if you let's say you're doing business, and you, and you you always want to be fair, you always want to honor your word, you always want to treat people right. I want to say that that even if there's not a supernatural aspect of it, that there's some percentage of that, you know, that people will respect that your that your word matters to you, and that you always have a good business ethic, and so people will respond in kind. But that's not consistent. That's right. And I've seen too many people who have a strong ethic, who are absolutely admirable, wonderful people, who get utterly shit on. Yeah. With with no kind of justice. I'm not saying that 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 happened, that happened to me. I'm kind of odd in that I'm saying I'm on the other end. I, I just always had good shit, even when I didn't do anything to earn it, even when I didn't deserve it, even when I did shit that should have caused me to, 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 to get the bad karma, and it just never happened to me. But it happened to a lot of other people who deserved a hell of a lot better, and it, it breaks my heart that they went through that, not me. Right. I get that. I do. I get that because I know personally a lot of great human beings who I feel deserve a break and it bothers me when i when i see them that i can't help them and that they continue to go through so much hardship and i really and i really hate that so i mean i've definitely seen that too and then i've seen assholes people who you know you you get to know them and you're like you are a terrible human being and they get promoted to ceo they they start making a uh, 100,000 a year they they have a house, two houses, and it's just you you just they become president. <laughs> they become president. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> but no, I mean I've I've seen that same thing, and I I agree. It's a it's a it's a really sad situation. Yeah. Well, um, thank you. Thank you for being on the show, and it's been an awesome interview. And uh, sorry hey, that it went a little bit long. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. Hey, maybe in one of your next videos, uh, you know, you can give us a shout out because we're cool guys over here. Um, let people know about us. We're just getting started. And uh, yeah, I like the format of you know saying, "Is this real?" Oh, is that for real? Is that yeah, I, I like that idea. Uh, there, there was a thing that Penn and Teller did a number of years ago called Bullshit. Yeah. Did you ever see their, their show? Bull I loved that. No, no, I never saw that. My favorite episode, if you're going to only watch one episode of Penn and Teller's Bullshit, it's the one on bottled water. <laughs> okay. That was see really, it. It, it, bottled water and feng shui. I think they did both in the same episode, bottled water and feng shui. It's absolutely fucking brilliant. Yeah. And they kind of refuted their own position on libertarianism when they extol the virtues of having government controlled uh, regulations on water quality. <laughs> but, Good old satire, huh? But, but yeah, but it's, but it's still a brilliant episode. And the, uh, the whole idea behind bullshit was to take a given subject and show what bullshit it is. And they didn't always get that right. I mean, they, they complained that, in, that, that climate change, for, for one point, they, at one point they were climate change deniers. They, were, they denied that. And they, they both learned the evidence later and changed their position, much to their credit. Right. But, but uh, for, when they started the show, they were still climate change deniers, which was a little disturbing. Uh, but they, they've done a num they, they, any episode that I've ever seen of, of bullshit I could recommend. I loved taking the, the, the whole thing on, on the reflexology and chiropractic and, and all of those kind of pseudoscience, you know, acupuncture and all of those and showing what bullshit all they are. And the, the experiments that they use to prove that are hilarious. You got to believe it, man. You just got to believe, all right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I, I like the format. <laughs> I, I like the format of what you're, what, what you're saying about, you know, yeah. like taking, taking a subject and showing what is the truth of this? Yeah. 
because that's my, that's my big problem with creationism. There ain't no truth to it, not just to yeah. creationism, but to religion in general. Any religion, get, get uh, members of any 10 religions and have any of them produce one truth that shows that, 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 they, that there's a there there. That, right. that there's even a supernatural. All of them are claiming uh, these things about absolute truth. They all claim to be absolute truth, right? Well, they, if they all have mutually exclusive positions, they all can't be absolute truth, right? But right. absolutely all of them can be wrong, and they can all be absolutely wrong. Yeah. So which one can show any truth to their position? Yeah. Well, that's what, you know, that's what we try to do. We try our best to represent all aspects of an argument fairly. We don't try to have an opinion either way as much as we just try to dispute the aspects of the topic. And then we, you know, we let the people decide if you believe that great. If you don't, well, that's fine too. Here's what we think. Yeah, given that, that description and that I understand that the format about, you know, interviewing me separate from interviewing a creationist. Right. Because, because I, I promise you that if you just had me on with a creationist, <laughs> It it would be a train wreck, uh, and it would it, <laughs> it would be entertaining for a lot of people who like train wrecks. But I remember, I think you did a promo <laughs> for your video with Kent Hoven, and I think if I remember to quote you or to try to quote you, uh, my memory's terrible. But you said there will be a lot of hooping and hollering, but it won't be a debate. You said something to that, you know, you know, something about, you know, yada, yada, yada. Apparently people think that I'm going to debate Kent Hovind and, you know, yada, yada, yada. And there will be a lot of, you know, this and that, but it won't be a debate. And uh, I just, I remember laughing my ass off. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's classic R and raw right there. <laughs> Well, I appreciate that very much. I very best of luck with your with your channel and this Thank format. You. I don't know how you could improve because uh, I always want to improve something like, especially when it's a good idea yeah. and you want to keep it going. But I, I like when you take any to take a topic and try to find the truth of it. Okay. That's brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, we want to thank Aaron Ra for being on the show. And yeah. I have to say that I'm grateful and surprised by the interview. It went so much better and so much differently than I had imagined it would be. Mm -hmm. I had thought about discussing things with him for years. I even used to keep track of uh, the cities he would visit, you know, for his conferences and talks that he would do. And... Um, you know, I really appreciate, uh, you know, even him opening up about his personal growth. Towards yeah, him. that was nice. Yeah. I was not expecting that. Yeah. I really yeah. wasn't. And especially the way he was talking about how, uh, and looking back over the last 11 years or whatever, yeah. like every year yeah. he'd look back and, you know, kind of shake his head at himself and try to do better. Right. I think that's a fantastic attitude. And the way... Like from what you said, because yeah. I haven't seen any of his old stuff. I kind of felt the same way he yeah. felt towards the end about a lot of stuff, too. Yeah. You know, I'm sure we all do. We look at a lot of the things that happen and the injustice, things that look apparently not fair. And we're truly, anybody who has a heart mm -hmm. is disturbed greatly yeah. by, by seeing that kind of stuff. Sure. I appreciated his willingness to like talk about his friend who's a big Christian. Like yeah. he's a great guy, a real sweetheart. You know, I don't think badly of him, but he views religion as a net negative. Yeah, which I understand. Yeah. I do understand that perspective. I've heard that before. I agree with that. But at least he's balanced enough to recognize that it's not like everything about it is bad. Right. But in his view and estimation, it's a net negative overall. And right. that's a much more uh, moderate position than some of the people you read in the New Atheist Movement who are just all vitrolic and terrible. But I understand that that's how R used to be. <laughs> that's how he was early on, right? I haven't seen his older stuff, but he was very like that too. But it shows a lot of growth. And I, I can respect that because I do respect what people choose to believe as long as it makes people good people. But yeah. he, he brought up a point that we were both surprised about, about the warm-blooded dinosaurs. What was your take on that? I'm still surprised by that. Uh, all these years, you know, growing up, all of us, 
Dinosaurs are, I mean, what do we think of when we think of dinosaurs usually, or at least what we did growing up? Some kind of reptile-related cold-blooded creatures. <laughs> Giant lizards. Giant, <laughs> big-ass, <laughs> overgrown lizards. That's how we thought of them, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So that that surprises me. I still got to do some more research on that one. But yeah, yeah. no. But he Thanks did, for that he, it did, if it's true. And, you know, he's the expert here. I have no reason to doubt. Yeah. I don't think he would say something without a lot of research because he's not known for that, right? Uh, yeah. It he's would not, make the transition <laughs> from dinosaurs to birds make more sense because your objection was, well, but if dinosaurs were cold-blooded, had they changed to birds? Yeah. And he says, well, they're not, or at least the thinking is that they were warm-blooded. Yeah, because that to me seemed like way too many leaps. Yeah. It's like, okay, whoa. And then he's when he's talking about his emus, which is was awesome. <laughs> Poor emu got taken away from him. I could just I picture this big dude, Aaron Ra, walking down the street with an emu just tagging along next to him, going to the park. Liberty Mutual saves you money. <laughs> Exactly. But he's, he was talking about the, how do you say it, a vestigial? Yeah, the, the, the claw, the, the finger. The claws that are there, but they can't be used because there's no muscles that support them. And so they're like pointless limbs. And his point was that, well, why would God create pointless limbs? But in the case of evolution, it makes perfect right. sense that over time it was no longer necessary. But the DNA was still there for them to grow or whatever. And so they're there, but they're just not functional. Here is, here is and yeah, and this is where even as a skeptic of a lot of popular evolution theories uh, or even so-called information and facts that I can't help but say, yeah, I mean, it seems legit because some of the things that you see on animals and even us that don't appear to be necessary or make any sense or even counterproductive to the creature's survival. Uh, I mean, it doesn't make sense from a creationist standpoint if, you know, God created the, all things perfectly, as, uh, as he says, because yeah. some things just don't, from our reasoning capabilities, seem to make any sense. I agree with that. Some of this, yeah, some of the stuff does not make sense. Yeah. And one of the things that uh, I was iffy on with Aaron is he was talking about when you got into abiogenesis. Yeah. I'm not an expert at all. Yeah. But after listening to James Storr, you know, who is a uh, organic synthetic chemist or yeah, synthetic yeah, organic right. chemist and just really dig into how impossible it is. And I went and I looked up one of the people that Aaron mentioned about that had supposedly created cells in the lab or whatever. Yeah. They did, but these were like the most simplistic kind of, this was no cell that was created at all. Uh, so it's just, it's a huge <clears throat> leap. It's a stretch to go from that, which has been done, which, hey, that's awesome because right. it's got all kinds of applications to medicine and that you could make smarter drugs that would right. know how to, you know, function inside of people, whatever. Good thing. I'm glad. Right. I'm glad that it's progress is being made. But it reminded me of what James Tor said, that this little bitty thing will be just like extrapolated out yeah. into something it is nowhere near. And then the media will ramp it up and suddenly everyone's saying that, oh, well, they created life in the lab. No, no, that's right. not what that is. Uh, and he has this great example of a turkey, which you'd have to watch his uh, a proto turkey okay. uh, that he says, like, it's imagine taking a bunch of feathers. And I'm going to get some of this wrong, but imagine taking a bunch of feathers <laughs> and like some sticks and shoving all this stuff on there and throwing it in front of someone and saying, look, that's the predecessor to a turkey. Right. Like. No, it's a bunch of feathers and some sticks. It's not a turkey at all. And he that's how James Tor says that's what's going on. His in the video, labs. yeah, his video was uh, was very interesting regarding chemistry. And I'm sure you'll put a link to that in the description. Yeah, I'll, I'll put it in this one. I put it in last week's and I'll put it in this one too. And for anybody who knows a lot about uh, his work and uh, his theories regarding that, uh, feel free to let us know in the comment section. And Aaron, if you're watching and you you know, uh, know a lot about that, fill us in. I'd love to see a rebuttal to James I, Tour's I video. Would too. I haven't been able to find one yeah. yet. Uh, and in the comments, you don't read many people trying to, you know, rebut the statements that he said. Right. But if there's a good explanation right. for the things that uh, James Tour is saying are not yet possible, I'd yeah. love to see 
that rebuttal because I'm interested in both sides. I always am. I am too. And and yeah, I mean, you know, for the viewers out there and uh, Aaron and everyone watching, uh, we're not shooting anything down Mm-mm. as much as we're respectful skeptics on both sides. Yeah, I'm definitely skeptical on the abiogenesis side just because I haven't seen anything that shows it's even remotely possible. Right. And the probabilities are so ridiculously high. So I'm reserving right. judgment on that one. Uh, I definitely get the dinosaur to bird thing more, having listened yeah. to Aaron, though, because I was kind of, eh, I don't know about that. But then he talks about in the same way that there's a certain DNA line that you can follow from pre-human primates to us to Homo sapiens, he says there's that same DNA line you can follow from yeah, the dinosaurs that is interesting. up to birds, and that did make it make more sense. I mean, to me. T-Rexes do kind of look like big-ass birds. I mean. <laughs> oh, speaking of that, his comment on uh, Jurassic Park. Getting, <laughs> <laughs> Jurassic Park. <laughs> getting uh, the Velociraptor wrong, because it should have been covered in feathers, but they showed it like we were talking about, like a big lizard. Yeah. But that the Velociraptor would have been more like a... <laughs> How'd you put a scary ass big bird? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's one scary ass bird. Yeah, that was, yeah, definitely uh, not birds going. you don't want to mess with. <laughs> yeah, not going into that neighborhood. Yeah. No way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you, that that made that line of evidence make more sense. I'm not fully sold on either side, but I'll give the man the yeah. fact that he's very eloquent and he definitely added a, a number of points. Right. On the evolutionary side that I hadn't thought about before. Yeah, that, he, no, he did. He made some great points. He, he knows his stuff. Yeah, yeah, I learned a few things. I did. Um, surprised me a few times. So, Well, yeah. hopefully you guys learned something. We'd love to know what you think, so be sure to yeah. tell us in a comment below. And Especially you, about the chemistry thing. Yeah, especially that. I'd love to see any any kind of rebuttal, even if yeah. I'm only going to We're understand. both scratching our heads at that one going, man. Yeah, even if I'm only going <clears> to <throat> understand half of what they're saying. Yeah. Just to get the gist, I'd love to see one if there is one. So let us know if you know about one. Uh, but if you have something you want to talk about on the show, be sure to contact us at the email address you see above because we're always looking for new people to interview. And again, thank you very much, Aaron Ra, for being on the show. It's just completely unexpected that we would even be able to have such a, such an important figure talking and that he was willing to give us so much of his time. That was great. I appreciate that very much. Definitely. So be sure to like the video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the notification icon so you'll be notified when we, when we release new videos. And as always, thanks for watching.